So we all know moving is tough. Packing boxes, saying goodbye to familiar surroundings, navigating new neighborhoods. It's a drag. It's enough to make anyone break a sweat. But you know what's even worse than that, plant friends? Moving with houseplants. <laughs> oh my goodness. If you know, you know. And if you haven't moved with your houseplant collection yet, you're very lucky because This episode today is going to save you a lot of stress. Today, we are diving into the jungle of relocation in hopes that it makes the wild ride of moving with houseplants a little more manageable. Welcome to the Growing Joy with Plants podcast, where we not only learn how to care for plants successfully, but how to simply and affordably use our plant babies to cultivate more joy in our lives by doing so. I'm Maria, former plant killer turned happy plant lady, author of Growing Joy, The Plant Lover's Guide to Cultivating Happiness, speaker, podcaster, and most importantly, your new best plant friend. On Growing Joy with Plants, you'll find conversations about houseplant care, gardening tutorials, and wellness through the lens of plants. Plant care is self-care on Growing Joy. Hello! plant friends. Welcome to Growing Joy with Plants. I'm Maria, your host. If you're new here, welcome. I'm here to help you care for plants and grow joy in your life while doing so. If you're a repeat listener, welcome home, my friends. It's so nice to be growing with you on a weekly basis. Thanks for subscribing. Today's episode is so great because it is all about moving with houseplants. And I'm joined by my dear plant friend and plant aficionado, the one and only Becca of Becca de la Plants. You might know her from her incredible YouTube channel or her Instagram channels, or maybe even from her book, Houseplants for Beginners. She is a dear plant friend of mine, and we have both moved a lot in the last year. Becca has made like a cross-country move. I have made smaller moves, but I've moved three times. We have both toted our plant collections of over 100 plants each far and wide, and we have come up with a lot of tips for how to move with houseplants because it's a whole different thing with just moving you know, non-living articles. And a lot of the tips we're giving you are from mistakes that we've made. (laughs) So happy you're listening. We have a lot to cover, so I'm going to dive right in. Here's Becca. Becca, welcome back to Growing Joy. When was the last time you were on the podcast? It was a while back. Was it the plant tube collaboration? Yeah, it was. It was with Adam and Nicole. That was 2020. Yeah. Oh, the Plant Parenthood last year, right? When we did that. Yeah. Yeah. My friend, we have lived such parallel lives, I feel like, in the last couple of years. We're country girls now. You're a country girl. How do you feel? Yeah. It's such like a funny thought that I'm a country girl. (laughs) Yeah. But yeah, I am. I just spent a week in the Bahamas and I came back to my place and I was like, this feels more beautiful than Mm. literally the Bahamas, which is such a crazy Mm -hmm. thought. But We came back and it's just like bursting with life and spring and it's so green. It's such a gift to live somewhere like this, like kind of shrouded in the trees. Um, I feel like a fairy like all the time. Yes. Like a woodland nymph. Yes. Yes. It's so special. I love it so much. So much more than I ever thought I would. Yeah. And on a conversation about moving, can you share a little bit what the last couple of years have looked like for you? where, why, how you've moved and how you've kind of nested in your current home? Yeah. So I am from Tucson and I've always lived there. I've always wanted to leave. I wanted to leave so bad, but I just never was able to. And then I met my husband in Tucson and he worked there. He got he got moved there for work. And then, um, you know, we met, fell in love, got married, you know, the whole thing. And then we ended up moving to Missouri, which was like, when I found out it was Missouri, I was like, okay, <laughs> it's not a glamorous state by any means. Like, I'm not going to be the first one to say that. But then I came out and visited like when I it was in 2020, I came out here to like, look at houses that I had been looking at online. It's so hard to buy a house online. And so many people buy their houses like sight unseen. Now I literally could never do that. That is insane to me because some of the houses that I was so excited about, I like stepped in and I was like, no, <laughs> Like immediately, no. But anyway, so we ended up buying our house here and it's on like seven acres in the woods. And it's just been such a change because I lived like in the city in Tucson. So I would ride my bike all the time. I was able to walk places. I didn't really walk that often, but like I could, I I could like walk to work. I was a teacher for a little bit. 
And but mostly I would ride my bike. And so it was so weird coming here. Like when I visited, I rented a bike because I that's how I get around. And it's so hilly. So that's like out the window. Um, <laughs> and it just doesn't make sense to ride your bike places here unless you are like a serious cycler. So there was so many things that like just change my routine. Everything about my life totally changed. I learned how to mow a lawn, had never mowed a lawn in my entire life. And now I'm a whiz with our zero turn, just like taking down grass. We mow probably like three acres of our land. And man, it's just been so cool to live such a different life than what I lived before. And it just feels so full. I always feel busy. Like I remember having so much downtime when I lived in Tucson and I would kind of I always found ways to fill my time, but it was like, oh, I'm going to sew or do this or do that. And now it's like, okay, well, now I have all these chores that I have to do every season. I have to mulch. I have to do my garden. And it just feels really like I'm living like the retirement dream while also (laughs) hustling and like working. So it's kind of like a fun juxtaposition. And in Tucson, you were for the most part a houseplant parent. And then when you moved to your current home in Missouri, You installed the most insane garden, a greenhouse. Like, what has that looked like? Because you also moved, what was your garden zone in Tucson? And what is your garden zone in Missouri? I'm very different climates. I'm pretty sure Tucson's a zone nine. And here I'm a zone six. And based on what I've heard from other gardeners is like zone six is really great. It's like a perfect, you can grow pretty much anything you want in zone six, which is so cool. I've really gravitated towards like hydrangeas and just like so many there's so many beautiful native plants here too so it's just fun to be able to grow those things that just need so much water that you it's totally irresponsible to have them in Arizona but like here it's not a big deal because you know the land replenishes itself it rains and all of that but yeah I I went really big (laughs) I had all this space so I made like a 40 by 40 garden which is ridiculous I Every year since the year I did it, I'm like, this is so much. I have like 11 planter boxes. I don't need 11. I need probably two. Wow. You know, it's just, it's too big. So there's that. But it was, it would have looked weird to have this like little tiny garden on all of this space. So I was like, let's, let's fill it. And my greenhouse is 12 by 24. So also like just ridiculously too big. But you grow into these things, I guess. And You can kind of use them for different purposes each year. So I'm kind of still figuring out how I want to use the spaces each year. Well, I think I did an episode on greenhouses a while back, and I feel like I interviewed multiple people who have greenhouses. And I think the one of the main pieces of feedback is go bigger, don't go smaller. Because I think when you're making such a big investment in a greenhouse or in an epic garden, I mean, you installed a huge fence, all those planter beds, like we're talking you know, probably I'm going to guesstimate around at least a thousand, if not more dollars, just in like lumber, you know what I mean? Just in stuff, you don't want to install something and then grow out of it in the next year. So I do think it makes sense that you went big your first year, knowing that you could grow into it, or, you know, maybe six of those raised beds turn into just like perennial cut flowers that like, you don't really have to do that much to. And then a couple of planters end up being for edibles. But I can totally relate to the first year we both moved rural in 2020. And I felt the same way. I mean, I had some life circumstances that came up that I didn't end up installing a garden on my property. But I was ready for like, I mean, the scale that you I don't know what that is. But I feel like when you get this new opportunity, you're like, I'm gonna send it I'm gonna do this to the biggest capacity. And um, I think some people would argue that maybe like start small and then grow into it. But when you're building structures, I do feel like that's a very specific moving need. So when you were in Tucson, did you ever have a desire to garden or it was the land in Missouri that inspired you? I would say it was majority the land that inspired me. My parents live in the suburbs, so they had like a big yard or have a big yard and some garden that they do like container gardening. Like, honestly, it's just my dad throwing like old rotten tomatoes in a pot and then like he gets tomatoes year round. Like he just always is able to pick them and they have lemons. And uh, so, yeah, that was kind of how I flexed that muscle or that desire when I was growing up and in college, I would, you know, go to their house and like dig. And I don't even know why I did that. Like I just would randomly decide to plant things in their yard, but it wasn't really like I wasn't growing food. It was mostly flowers and just helping my mom in the garden and my parents and stuff. 
really when I got here, I was like, well, why not grow food? When you garden, you realize how little you actually cook because then you have all this produce that's like fresh and really tasty. But then you're like, I don't know how to use this. So that's sort of the roadblock that I've experienced. So now I'm just kind of growing things that I know for sure that I'll eat because I don't want to waste my time and resources growing like really intricate gourds. It, you know, like there's so many cool things. Like it, it's <laughs> yes, like the gourds, the gourds. Yeah, they're beautiful and it's fun and it's fun once. Like I think it's so fun to learn how plants grow and develop, but I totally relate to that. Like um I also feel like with seed starting, like you realize what's worth starting seeds and then what's not worth starting seeds. Like it's not worth starting zinnias indoors, you know, but it is worth starting micro dwarf tomato plants because you can't find them at the local garden center. But I'll say the local garden center always gets me for that. Like last year I grew Vietnamese coriander. I saw it at the garden center. I was like, what is this? I'm going to get this. It smells so cool. I grew it. It was huge. It was, it was very happy on my balcony garden. But I never cooked with it because I didn't know what to do with it. And I probably could have Googled a little harder than I did. But I do feel like we all fall prey to that of, oh, but this is at the garden center and it looks so cool and fun. And then you just ne- <laughs> you just never do anything with it. We dried yeah. it. We totally. dried it. Yeah. That's how I was with basil a couple of years ago. Like I had a huge, like basically bush of basil and like it's the end of the season and I hadn't used any of it because I don't cook that often. I mean, I do, but like it's just different. And I was like, okay, well, I guess I can like harvest this and dry it. I still have it in my my spice drawer. Like I still haven't used it all. So whatever, I just never plant basil again. I don't know. It's just like you are able to grow so much. And I guess I can see how people are able to share so much because these plants are just like made to grow, which is so crazy coming from the houseplant world where it's like you get one leaf every quarter sometimes more often, but not that often. And you're like offended when people ask you to take a cutting of your plant, you know, or it's like the cuttings are very valuable. And you're like, no, please take my tomatoes, take my tomato seedlings. Like I started too many. There's the classic, like you grow 10 tomato plants because they're so small in the beginning of the season. And then in the middle of the summer, you're like paying people to take the tomatoes off your hands or you're freezing them. Yeah, you're like driving. Okay, it was zucchini for me the first year. I planted four zucchini in like a four by four space, which was so I did not know how big they got. It's like you need one zucchini for a four by four space and it will take over. I was like, I'm going to start shoving these in my neighbor's mailboxes. Like it's gonna be like the zucchini lady's coming like the zucchini lady's coming. (laughs) Lock down the mailboxes because I was like, I am this close to like breaking federal laws and like putting stuff in these people's mailboxes. (laughs) <laughs> truly it's but that's also how you learn right and I feel like for people who move and if you are moving and you are a beginner gardener and you're going to start gardening just like trust that you're going to make so many mistakes in your first couple of years like I failed so miserably at growing carrots this year but this past summer but I learned so much and I'm so excited to try again and I always pick some sort of edible that I've never grown before. This year, it's going to be potatoes for me. Last year, it was carrots where I was like, I have these carrot seeds. It was 99 cents for the packet. I didn't do too much research. I was like, I know that these will be good in my like tomato companion plant grow bag, but I didn't thin them. They didn't have enough space. You know, it just I I didn't give them enough sun. But I learned so much from failing in the first year. And this year, I know so much more. I'm so excited to try again. So I feel like I do feel like sometimes, especially when you move to a place and you have the big dreams and you want to install the greenhouse and you want to install the garden and you want to be that like garden girl, you can totally have that, but you have to prepare yourself that it's not all going to go the way it planned. And I do think that's a classic, whether you're a beginner gardener or an advanced gardener, like there's always going to be something chaotic that happens in your garden that year. Totally. And if it's not you like forgetting to thin something out, it's going to be like rabbits or squash bugs or deer. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. I pretty much. uh, It's so frustrating. Like my garden has been ruined. Like the beginning of my garden has been ruined for two years in a row because some animal eats my stuff. And I made this big fence enclosure, like you mentioned, took me forever. Tons of man hours. And it still doesn't keep them out. I mean, you built a really epic fence. 
Do you think they're voles? Do Because the voles are underground. Do you think they're like moles or voles or something? That definitely happens because I have seen like tunnels in my garden beds. And I didn't put the mesh on the bottom because I was like, eh, whatever. And, you know, now that they're like there, that would be so annoying to lift all of that up. And then again, there's just so many lessons that you learn gardening and none of it is really, you know, it's not the end of the world, any of it. But it is, yeah, there's a lot that you learn and you change your plans year to year and it's fun. The summer brings tons of opportunities to give gifts, whether it's for weddings, graduations, showers, anniversaries, holidays, and what better gift to give someone you love than a personalized Wind River wind chime. Plus, you don't need to leave your house to shop for one. Wind River Chimes will deliver the most magical, most thoughtful, and personalized gift straight to the door of your beloveds because when you use the code GROWINGJOY at checkout, you get a free engraving on any engravable wind chime so you can personalize it for your loved one with a special saying, a memorable date, or a name. For over 35 years, Wind River Chimes has been passionately pursuing harmony by delivering wind chimes that help create a peaceful, soothing, and restful environment. And now that we are in the swing of gardening season, enjoy Enjoy the perfect gardening weather with the perfectly calming and inspiring sound of Wind River Chimes. Every night in the summer, I sit on my balcony garden with a drink, just listening to the chimes in the wind, looking at the stars. It's a freaking dream, and it makes an amazing gift for yourself or for someone else. So all you have to do is to go to windriverchimes.com and use code GROWINGJOY at checkout to get a free engraving on any engravable wind chime. They have options of colors and sounds. You can just go on the website and click through and listen to all the beautiful sounds. It's so relaxing. Get it engraved with that personalized name or anniversary date or special message. Head to windriverchimes.com to listen to all of the melodious options and use code GROWINGJOY for a free engraving. I hope you know my friend Camille Bell Hill from her Instagram account, Plant Blurred Online. She's been a dear plant friend of mine for a few years. And I'm excited to tell you about her new book, Happy Plants, Happy You. In Happy Plants, Happy You, you will learn how houseplants can help you avoid burnout and bring a healthy focus to your own self-care. As it turns out, when you tend to your houseplants, you're also tending to yourself. And I think everybody who listens to Growing Joy knows this intuitively. So in Happy Plants, Happy You, Camille dives into advice on avoiding vampire relationships with plants, a wish list of the best tools for houseplant parents, how to date several plants before settling on the ones that work best for you, and so much more. Happy Plants, Happy You, it's a self-care book, it's a plant care book, and it's by a dear friend of mine. Pick it up at your favorite local bookstore, bookshop.org, Barnes & Noble, or Amazon.com. That's Happy Plants, Happy You by Camille Bell Hill, wherever books are sold. So what did your houseplant collection look like in Tucson, and what does it look like now in Missouri? Has your houseplant collection changed? It has. I feel like I'm much more adventurous. Well, okay, so... I've actually thought about this a lot, how it has changed. And it's changed largely due to location, but also just experience. You know, like that was almost four years ago that I was living in Tucson. And so I have four years of plant knowledge on my back now. You know, that's quite a long time to keep learning. But in Tucson, I was mostly like Syngonium. I had lots of cacti and succulents just because they're so easy. You just put them on the porch. You literally don't do anything with them, (laughs) even here, honestly. But I had a lot of more like peperomia. I don't know, just like little, little plants that I wasn't exactly expecting to like stick around forever, but they were really fun. And the houseplant selection in Tucson was way different than what we have here. I would say here in Colombia, it's much more exotic and yeah, like tropical instead of cacti. Yeah. And I always say Columbia, but it's not Columbia the country, which is way cooler. But no, Columbia, Missouri, mid Missouri. But yeah, the climate here just supports houseplants a little bit better just because it's not so hot and it's a lot more humid. So our garden centers are able to have a little bit more like unique, cool things. Also, we're closer to Florida, you know. So my collection now, there's definitely more like anthurium and like cooler, more collector philodendron but I always fall back on like the pothos the hoya carnosas those are always going to be in my collection and just be 
the stars because they're just so easy and fun and they can live anywhere. And you're a new mom. So you also have that layer on top of like you are dividing your time probably very differently between your baby and your job and your plants in a way that you were not. You had 100% of that time for your plants in Tucson. Yes, I did. I did. And I don't know. There's been so many moments where I'm like, wow, what did I do before I had Nora? Like I had so much time. And, you know, it's brain space as well that gets taken up by having a kid. But it's been cool to see like what I don't know. There are certain things in life that happen that kind of make your plant priorities present or they just kind of shape. They I don't know. They make it obvious to you. Because there's a lot of times in my life where like I know what needs to happen, but I don't want to do it. Like, for example, getting rid of some plants or downsizing heavily or something like that. Like moving is a big thing that causes you to do that because you kind of realize who you want to stick around when it comes time to move. Because then you picture yourself lugging all of these plants Mm -hmm. and you're like, I can't do that. Yeah, And the decision is kind of made for you. And it was similar with having Nora. Like I really went into it like, no, I'm not going to get rid of that many plants. And I think that I've downsized by like at least 20. Uh, Not all by choice. A lot of them have also died. But wow, it's just life changes, causes your collection to change and seasons. Yeah, seasons. Seasons of life. You're going through different seasons of life. So, okay, this is perfect because you made this really huge move. I moved three times in 2020, like a real psychopath. So we both have a lot of experience moving with a lot of houseplants. So I was thinking you and I could go and compare our experiences pre-move, during the move and post-move, kind of compare notes and see like what worked and what didn't work for us in our histories of moving. So maybe we can help someone in the future make a few less mistakes than we did. So you kind of already started talking about what did the preparation look like for you when you were in Tucson, you knew you were moving to Missouri. What did that preparation look like? How did you go about making the decision of what's staying and what's going? Yeah. Well, basically, if a plant was already on the edge, I wasn't really into it that much anyway. Obviously, that was like easy to get rid of or just throw away. I know it's a little controversial. Not everybody loves that. But sometimes when you're moving, it's like. It just happens sometimes. So there were, I don't know, maybe like 10. If I'm estimating, I don't remember quite exactly, but you know, maybe five to 10 plants that I just was like, I'm not taking these ones. I know that for sure. Obviously, I have a large plant collection, like over 100 at least. And so I had committed. It was like full send. I'm I'm getting a U-Haul for these plants. So when you have that option, you you know, you don't need to downsize as much because you're already getting a U-Haul. So... So you got a separate U-Haul for your plants, like the one that is attached to your car? Yeah. So we had a moving company. Yeah, we had a moving company that took all of our house stuff. And then Mm -hmm. they don't take plants. I wouldn't want them to anyway. But but then we got like a little, like the smallest size. The little boxes. Yeah. Yeah. I think it ended up being like $300, which honestly, in the grand scheme of things, it's $300. But to replace all of those plants so expensive you know so it'd probably be about the same so I was like well I might as well just keep my plants so so that was basically the prep I made sure they all got a good watering before like I showered them to hope hopefully like cut down if there was a plant I mean a a pest thing going on hopefully it wouldn't run rampant but I definitely did some sort of treatment uh watered them and then started packing them up and that was basically all of the prep what did you pack them up with like did you get the rubber tubs did you get boxes like did you get crates what did you end up lugging them around in it was kind of both so I used boxes and the boxes was what I would suggest other people do I kind of just threw them in there and filled up the bottom of the box obviously none of them were very heavy so it was pretty easy to lug around a lot of them were too tall for the boxes. So what I would suggest is getting the wardrobe boxes that are extra tall that you like hang your clothes on. Our movers brought those. And I was like, I've never seen this box before, but that's perfect for houseplants. So if you can find those, that would be way, way better. Just to protect the plant fully because the plants that I had fully enclosed in a box and I could like tape the box shut, those plants received like zero damage, none. It was the plants that were kind of in a crate, just out, 
that Lucy with their leaves hanging out and stuff. Yep. Yep. And I don't know what it was about just the enclosure because it would be probably the same amount of friction, but for some reason it just was worse off to not have them in the boxes. So that's really the number one thing that I would suggest doing differently than what I did. And did you move your plants on the same day or did you move them on a different day? It was the same day. So and they were we stopped. So it was a two day drive. And I was really worried that they would be like too hot or something in the moving truck. But really, plants get moved on a truck when they're coming to your stores. Yeah. So that's literally how they get to your garden center. Yeah, exactly. So they're a lot more strong than I think we are wanting to give them credit for. But they can handle being in the dark for like a day or three or even five if they need to. But hopefully not. But you know what I mean? That was really something I'm going to be doing next time I move is just making sure they're all in boxes covered and you know those like craft thing the craft paper covers that they come in when they get shipped when like you order a plant to your house and they come wrapped in the plastic stuff that or also if you see a garden center post a new shipment or something like that and they take a picture and they pull the paper off of the plant yes yeah like it's like brown paper Yes. So the garden center is going to dispose of those. So what I'm going to do next time is I'm going to go to a garden center. and I'm going to say, hey, when you get your next shipment, can you hold those papers for me? If you're, unless they're using them for something else. So can you hold those papers for me and I'll come get them and use them for my move? Yeah. So, OK, this is interesting because I did things kind of differently. So I want to compare and contrast with you. I love your U-Haul idea. I did not think of that. The way we did it was we packed our cars full of plants and then the movers came and took all of our stuff. And then when I had the opportunity, two out of my three moves, I was able to take my plants a day ahead because we only moved within an hour of where, like we moved within 90 minutes of one place, within an hour of another place. So I was able to like get the keys and move my plants the day before we ended up moving all of our stuff. That was really nice because then I wasn't stressed about loading the plants up the day of the move. But I guess for you, because it was a two day drive, you didn't have that available to you. I totally also did the like laundry hampers filled with the plants or not laundry hampers, but I think they're called foot lockers, like the deep plastic tubs, but they're pretty tall. So I'd put my like eight inch plants in the bottom. I anchored them with all of our towels And then I'd put my smaller plants around like in on top of the soil. I'd nestle my little planters inside the eight inch plants lip of that pot. So I did like a little bit of a Tetra situation. And then I replicated the paper thing with newspaper. So I'd basically make cones of newspaper around each plant so that the newspaper kind of protected the leaves because I think most of the tubs that I moved all my plants went in were open and I was very nervous about leaf damage but we were kind of like flying by the seat of our pants and I was just like this is what we're doing we did have one wardrobe box that I put like my huge corn plant and a couple of tall plants in, and we anchored them with like towels and stuff like that and that got taped up and that went with the movers but yeah I do highly recommend for people if you're making a local move to move your plants a separate day if you can. It's not always available to you, but now I've done it three times and I've usually if you ask nicely, your landlord will let you in a day early or, you know, something like that. By my second and third moves, I was kind of burnt out and I was just like throwing shit in my car. But the first move, I also feel like I might have taken like damp paper towels and put them on top of the soil. So like they stayed moist and the soil didn't go everywhere because I feel like you get a lot of soil spillage. But I think giving everybody a good water and pest control, like a spray down is really smart. I love that tip. And then for us to the plants on the move that we couldn't take our plants ahead of time, they were the last thing to get loaded and the first thing to come off. That was the other way that we tried, like basically like your pets, right? Like the dog is going to be the last to go in the car, but they're going to be the first to come out because we just tried to minimize the amount of time that the plants were like sitting in a hot car. But I think you're so right. If we think about how these plants get to the garden centers, and also if you've ever ordered plants online, they're in a dark box jumbled around for sometimes weeks on end, right? And they're they're in these trailers. I mean, 
granted the plant garden center trailers are um they probably have some sort of climate control but they are hardier i do feel like i'm happy to hear you say that because i think there's a mindset that i think you have to get into when you're moving with plants similar to if you're starting a garden like what we'd said you have to know that you're probably going to lose one plant you're probably going to have some damaged leaves there's probably going to be an issue and i feel like if you go in with that in mind, like with any move, right? Like you're probably going to break a vase. You're probably going to lose a box. You're probably going to do whatever, right? If you go in with that mentality, then you set yourself up for such a sweet surprise of all of your plants doing a great job and making it, right? Instead of expecting all your plants are going to make it and then being devastated if you have a plant that goes south or if you have a plant that has the most beautiful leaf get, you know, snapped off accidentally or I just feel like there's a real mindset. And I think you can give yourself a lot of grace by just knowing it's nature is wild sometimes. And this is going to be just a wild moment in life that your plants are going to either weather or not. So moving to a new place means new gardening opportunities and new growth. A lot of people, when they move, they're upgrading the amount of space. Maybe all of a sudden they have outdoor space when they haven't, or maybe they just have more space indoors. And when you need top-notch garden containers, raised bed, plant supports, and more, including houseplant stuff, look no further than my favorite garden resource, Gardener Supply Company. Gardener Supply is an employee-owned gardening company that has been making growing easier and more enjoyable for over 40 years years. Whether you have acres to garden on or just a balcony like myself, they've got everything you need for successful indoor and outdoor growing. If you're craving fresh tomatoes, they have everything you need, the containers, the supports, the soils, the fertilizers, and the treatments to help you grow the tastiest tomatoes ever. And if you've seen the raised beds that I've recently installed for my mom and my sister on Instagram, those are the Gardener Supply Company's cedar raised beds, and they're a total dream. No matter what you're looking for, discover all of your gardening favorites and exclusive innovations at gardeners.com slash growing joy. And you can use code growing joy at checkout to unlock free shipping. That's gardeners.com slash growing joy and use code growing joy at checkout to unlock free shipping. Yeah, I think expecting imperfections is you have to, you have to, I mean, especially just moving a plant from one room to the other it can happen you know i can't ima- i can't even explain how many times i've snapped a leaf off just picking up a plant so you can imagine <laughs> picking it up putting it in your car yeah it's things are going to happen and the the good news is, is plants grow so in a couple months you can cut off that leaf and it's not even going to matter mm-hmm. it does kind of suck in the moment i'll admit there actually was this one situation which was so silly but it was so hot when we were moving from Tucson, we were just sort of getting silly, you know? Yeah. (laughs) We were loading up just like the little things that we wanted with us when we arrived to the house. And then the plants went into the U-Haul too. And I hung up a plant from like a little, a garden center hook. Oh, the little handle. Yep. That you like hang your dry cleaning on. Okay. Yes. Like that. But in the moving truck, there was like some like hook on the wall. I put that up there and it was directly above like some of my most prized cacti. (gasps) <gasps> and oh no it fell on the cacti it fell yep yep and you know the cacti still kind of look a little weird the ones that got hit <laughs> it's been four years but it's just it's a story and now I know to never do that I don't even know why I did that in the first place but it's just a blip it just happens but also moving I mean I think that's a really important story because you are never your best self moving moving is stressful I don't care how much you prepare. I don't care how many boxes you get ahead of time. I don't care how many places you walk around and get all their extra newspaper and you've got it all organized and you've got the movers and you've got it all. Moving is stressful. It's emotionally stressful. You're moving your homes. Homes are our most important feeling of stability. And you're in the massive moment of instability in your nervous system in that moment. There's logistical stress. The movers are going to be late. There's just always going to be something. And so you're not your best. So how, you're not going to be your best plant parent self because that's just it. That's just what it's going to be. So we kind of talked about like the day of moving, but do you have any other tips for the day of moving and like what to do in your move? Like on that overnight, did you leave the plants in the U-Haul or did you take them out of the U-Haul and bring them into the hotel? 
I think this is really going to depend on the season that you move because for me it was it was October like we arrived on October 1st so you can imagine from Arizona to Missouri and it was actually kind of chilly in Missouri so we ended up when we arrived here night of we brought everything in which was like not what you want to do after a 17 hour drive but you know it is what it is it was cold but because it was still warm where we stopped over overnight in New Mexico, we didn't bring them in. But if it was going to drop below 50 degrees, I would have been that wild person bringing like nine boxes of plants into my hotel room. So <laughs> sure. me too, I would have been that too. Yeah, it just depends. And in my, in my notes, I wrote down like if you can choose what season to move in, I would say like fall was great spring like late spring early summer is really great but like the dead of summer the dead of winter really hard just in general that's hard but you can't leave the plants in the car in those two seasons you know so that makes it a bit more difficult I moved in the dead of winter my second move was in the dead of winter it was December 30th it affected my plants like straight up. And but I did, I went in with the expectation that my plants were going to suffer from a move in the winter. And that was out of my control. That's when we had to move. And we were very mindful of like plants going last plants coming in ASAP. It snowed two inches the day of our move, we arrived and there was snow everywhere. It was a freaking nightmare. And then the next time we moved was in July. And it was way chiller. We were like, everybody's fine. Like we're throwing the plants in the car. We could put the plants on the lawn for an hour if we needed to. Like we're moving the plants in. We were able to move our plants ahead of time for that move. But it was still just, I do feel like the season really affects how stressed you need to be about with your plants. So I think you're right. If you can choose when you move early fall, late spring is definitely going to be the greatest time which I don't know if I've ever, I don't know if I have a hat since I've had plants. I don't think I've, and in all the moves I've done, I don't think I've ever been lucky enough to move. Well, no, I, my first move was in June, I guess, June 2020. So that was pretty easy. But yeah, that's so interesting. So what did unpacking your plants look like? What did you arrive, you know, like you said, so you arrived, there was a cold snap, you had to hustle to get all your plants indoors. And then what did your first like month of being in your new house look like with, you know, adjusting your plants and yourself to your new home? Yeah, it was okay. Well, it felt like a culture shock, which is such a funny thing to say because I was in the same country, but it was yeah. just like going from Arizona to Missouri yep. is yep. so different. And I'm sure going from the city to like upstate, wait, upstate, right? Is yeah. that what the terminology upstate would be? New York. Okay. Yeah, upstate New York. I'm so out of the loop with the East Coast. Um, <laughs> but I feel you. I feel you. Yeah, it's just so different. Um, so I, you know, honestly, like the first couple of days, we were like buying a lawnmower and like figuring that stuff out. So my plants really just kind of fell to the wayside, which was probably better because I wanted to just let them adjust. They moved from an apartment with like good lighting to this beautiful sunroom that you see behind me. So I mean, they were fine. Like they had like they got a massive upgrade. I mean, your plant room in your new home is so epic. So when you were house shopping, were you keeping your eye for a plant room or was this just a happy coincidence so okay there's a this thing called an arizona room in arizona which is it's like a sunroom basically i don't understand how that's practical at all but they exist so i was kind of thinking i would try to find something here and i kept seeing it in houses like they would have like a screened in porch or something like that so i did have it in mind that i would like a house like that and i definitely did think about the lighting in the house when I was looking at buying because it's house plants are a huge part of my life. It's my career also. So it's like, you have to be mindful of that to make a, a nice environment. And if I didn't have the the windows, I would have to do the light, like grow lights and stuff. So windows are obviously easier. So that was a big part of my shopping house shopping checklist. So when I saw this room, I was like, okay, yeah, that's what I want. This is what I need. It's perfect. And but yeah, the, I think the land sold me more than anything. But the, the bonus was this room. And it's really evolved into something so special. I love this room so much. I'm going to be sad someday to not have it. I don't know what I'm going to do. But it set this unfortunate precedence where any room that is not this is going to be like, oh, one window. I don't know. 
<laughs> yeah, you did such a good job. Because I feel like knowing you in your Tucson days, you have a very specific boho chic aesthetic that like your wedding was the most aesthetic wedding I've ever seen. Like you had the most <laughs> insane wedding. Thank you. And I do really feel like you replicated that in your room. And I think that's a good tip for people moving is to use your plants as your way to nest in your new space. And you really did. I mean, you thrifted all sorts of cool stuff for your room and you did your epic green wall with your sliding ladder and you really made it your own. And I feel like similar to me, we're both content creators, so we need content creation space. And so our plant rooms get prioritized when we move. I was set up in my office before anything was set up when we move. Like every time we move, it's okay, where are the plants going? Where's your office? Where's your filming area? And then we're also like, oh, but also where's the box with the pans for the kitchen, you know, but it's always that it's always that. But I think that it does anchor you in a nice way, because I feel like if your plants were just kind of be in the middle of your living room, kind of unstyled and untended to it wouldn't feel like your home. You know, it's a nice way to anchor yourself there. Totally. It like makes way for the personality of the room to just really shine because mm -hmm. there's so many different houseplant aesthetics. Like I have a series on my YouTube channel where you can use houseplants in so many different aesthetics, you know, minimalist, maximalist, boho, like witchy, you know, I've done a few videos in that realm. And it's so interesting because it's always the same plants, but just the everything around it looks different. And the containers maybe are a little different. Yeah. And the yeah, and the containers. So it's interesting to see how your plants can sort of push you in a direction for picking a house, picking de decorations, and just complement everything so well. But yeah, the the plant room was one of the first rooms that I finished. Not this final form, but it was another version, and I loved it so much. It was so cute. Just all the versions that this room has been in, it's really nice. But yeah, how about you with your place right now? Because you have this really awesome setup behind you, and like, yeah, because you've had so many different backdrops. I remember you had like the green wall. Yep. So how do you like come up with that? Just on another note, like the backdrop. Thank you for asking. Because I'm a podcaster and I do these interviews, it is the Zoom background essentially that I need for every interview that I do. And I feel like in all the homes that we lived in, and I'm lucky that I have a partner that supports that, but pretty much every home, every rental we've looked at is like, okay, but where's the office? Go where's Maria's office going? Where's the thing going? Because we're renters, in our second move, I bought this epic iron wooden bookshelf, I think on Wayfair, because we've lived in low light home. So sadly, our the home that I fell in love with plants in was very bright, southern facing windows, incredible. When we moved to the country, basically home after home after home has been low light because we're in the forest, right? And we lived in a log cabin for eight months. There's no light in a log cabin. And so I had to get really savvy with grow lights. And I realized, well, if I get a huge bookshelf and I just like blow out one of the shelves with lights, then I can keep all my plants there. And then I was like, this is a cool background for, for Zoom things, you know? So I think in every, in every house, you have to kind of like you said, like let the room inspire you and what you have around. So I've had different iterations of this bookshelf with the grow lights. I've had different shelving, different bookshelves different plants. But I'm also a renter. So you own so you've been able to really invest like we've had to get kind of savvy with our rental situations where you can't really do anything. So I think what a lot of people don't know about my home is that we moved to our current home thinking we would only be here for five months and it's been three years. So we moved into a furnished rental. And so my office has like, <laughs> I've never talked about this on the podcast before, but my office has like aesthetic areas and then there's a green wall and behind the green wall are two twin beds because this <laughs> is the kid's room that I took over as my office. So our house is kind of quirky in that way where there's just like weird things hidden in all the corners. But I hung a grow light in my closet to take care of all these plants that I have. And it's on top of like an old baby changing table from our landlord <laughs> <laughs> that I just put some like waterproof contact paper on top of and I'm like, we'll make do, you know, so I wouldn't say any of my space is the aesthetic that I really want. But 
we're just making do with what we can. And you see a very, you know, a very specific section of my, of my office. And then Frankie's cage takes up half of my office at this point too now. And he takes priority over anything, including my plants and my own life. So yeah, but I do feel like it's kind of fun. You know, we grow and evolve and change so much that it's kind of fun that I've had to have this challenge of like kind of changing it up every single time, because I do feel like I look at the old backdrops and be like, oh my God, remember that chapter of my life? Or, oh my God, remember, remember that chapter of my life? You know, it's really interesting. Do you feel like you have a Tucson era and a Missouri era? A hundred percent. And it's so yeah. funny to think like people remember all these different eras. You know, I mean, I remember your like fully green background and that whole era and people remember them. And it's so funny to look back at my old videos and I'm like, I used to just sit in my I lived in a studio when I started my channel and with my friend. So we just had our two beds in the background. <laughs> and, you know, just I remember I visited that house when I was in yeah. Tucson. Yeah, that was a you sweet did. little setup you had. You had it that was... amazing balcony. Yes, the balcony was amazing. And do you know how much my rent was? Oh, my God. What was it like? Five hundred dollars. Uh, yeah, the whole place was like five hundred dollars. I paid like two fifty. <gasps> Oh my gosh. It's unheard of. Like that place has like tripled or more in price since then, which my roommate and I are like, that's insane. Anyway. Yeah. This feels very much me in, in contrast. And it is so different. Like, I mean, I was so much younger too. I didn't really know so much of who I am. I know, I know myself so much better now and my style and I have so much more confidence. And I mean, not to say that I'm some interior designer or anything, but it's just like, I've had time to like collect pieces over the years and be like, oh, I like these pieces together and this works and this doesn't. And I'm definitely not a person who overthinks my interiors like at all. Like I just don't. So it is nice to just like have the space. I did the thing and now I can just enjoy it. And now in like, you know, when I move into a new place, I'm going to have to do it all over again and it'll be a different version of me, but the same. But because you you change I don't know if you listen back to old podcast episodes and even like your voice is different a couple of years ago. Oh my gosh. Yes. It's so strange. It's so strange. I used to have really short hair and I look at my like my first set of photos I ever took for back when the podcast was Blue and Girl Radio and I'm like, who is that girl? Yeah. <laughs> She's only wearing black. Like mm -hmm. I used to only wear black and gray when I lived in New York City and I had short really? hair and I was much thinner then too, when because I was, you know, on Broadway. But yeah, yeah, sometimes I look at those old photos and I'm just like, whoa, I'm so thankful to her, right? I mean, I'm mm -hmm. only me now because of her then and, you know, the work that she did. But yeah, what about you? Yeah, no, I feel the same. It's, I'm thinking right now, like how brave those versions of ourselves were. Yeah, yeah. To like, just put ourselves out there because in my current state of mind where I just had a baby, like confidence is a teetering, you know, like just things are so different for me mentally, emotionally, physically. Now, I don't know if I would have put myself out there in the same way that I did back then. A hundred percent. The naivete of it all. I mean, we have to have so much gratitude for those younger selves, for sure. I feel like you are in a metamorphosis of your own right now as you step into motherhood. I mean, I'm not a mother yet, but from what I've heard, it really does kind of shake it all up. And you're in another iteration of this evolution and it doesn't feel crystallized yet. But I think that's kind of exciting for you. It is. It's you feel like that. Yeah, I do. And I can kind of look back at like the version of myself when my husband and I were dating. You know what I mean? I feel like that's kind of where I am. I'm like, I'm dating this new version of myself that is a mom and also a career woman and like has all these things. And I am I know that there's going to come a point where I feel really comfortable or more comfortable, like how I feel in my marriage now. I feel very solid with Daniel, but I know there was a time where I was like, are we going to be together? Like, is this going to work? And now I, I mean, similarly bringing it back to plants, like there was a time taking care of plants where I was like questioning every single decision I ever made. I was Googling everything. And now it just kind of feels natural. Like I can look at a plant and kind of figure out immediately what's wrong with it. You know what I mean? Like it's just this comfort that comes with years of doing something. And I, 
<sighs> that that gives me hope that like someday being a mom will feel more like that than it's amazing, but it's just all new. It's all new. It makes me think of a juvenile Monstera and as it continues growing and it continues getting its first set of fenestrations and then the inner fenestrations are... I'll always remember on my honeymoon, we were in Costa Rica and there was this plant that at the spa had like taken over an entire wall. And I was just like, what is this plant? I've never seen it. It had all these beautiful, like three to five leaves on it. And what is it? And I traced it all the way down. It was a vining plant. I traced the vine all the way down to the bottom. It was a syngonium, oh. but it was a mature syngonium. And syngoniums, when they're mature in the rainforest, look unrecognizable to the syngonium that we have, you know, the arrowhead shaped syngonium that we have in our houseplant collections. And I just remember looking at it being like, holy moly, but that syngonium was going to evolve and grow and first grow a second spearhead and then grow a third, whether or not it wanted to, right? It's predestined in its DNA to continue growing and evolving. And I think there's a metaphor there for you and for, you know, us and so many people listening that I think, like you said, part of it is also just like letting go and trusting that you're just going to keep growing and the things that are coming into your, like motherhood is going to be another thing that just keeps making you richer, multifaceted, interesting. It's just going to be another layer as you continue like growing and evolving into the most mature iteration of your juvenile one leaf self, if that makes any sense. Was that just wackadoo or does that make sense? Are you tracking what I just said? My mind is blown and I'm just like trying to process like everything you just said because it that is probably the best metaphor that I have ever heard yeah. of like Oh, really? Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, of like what that process looks like because Yeah. Yeah, you look at this like unrecognizable leaf and you're like, who even is this? You like you look at yourself and you're like this is an unrec I don't even recognize who this person is. And then you trail it back and then it's this plant that you like you love. And wow, Maria, that was really that's good. I'm going to journal about this later. <laughs> got to put that in my next book, I think. Or I've got to make a real got to make a reel about that. You should. Yeah, I think about that a lot. That was a real. Do you ever have those moments with plants where it just like rocks your world? Like that really was like a moment that rocked my world and kind of changed perspective on life for me, <laughs> like forever and ever. <laughs> have you ever had any of those moments that you want to share? Yes. There's just so many lessons that plants can teach us. And like, it's so special to know. I don't know, all the little things. And there's been so many in motherhood specifically that I've just totally rocked my world because it's been uh, so layered. The whole process has been, it's felt so layered and Really, really sweet, but so challenging. And I don't know. Yeah. Do you have a motherhood analogy? I've thought about that a lot, like nature. I mean, mother nature. We look at the earth as the mother, the divine mother. But yeah, I'm curious. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Thinking about mother nature. Oh, gosh. There's just so many things. Just so mm -hmm. women are just mothers. And oh, yeah. Okay. Here's one. So I've been pretty open online about you know, experiencing postpartum depression and anxiety. And I experienced these things in life. So it was kind of hard to know where postpartum depression and anxiety started and where regular, like where that ended, like where did it turn into postpartum and where was it just me and like my normal baseline? So what I wrote down here is leaving a plant in a dark room will kill it quickly, but leaving it in a dark corner will kill it slowly. I think what I was trying to point out is that it's an isolation thing. So one of the things that I do when I'm experiencing hard things or I don't know exactly how to sort out my feelings or just whatever, I isolate myself and I just kind of get into this mindset that like, I'm annoying, I'm a burden, I'm all of these things. And when you become a parent or when you go through something just in general that changes your life, for me, my first instinct is to just kind of like close into myself and put myself in a dark room, essentially, or not even necessarily that, but just put myself in a dark corner. Because you know how like snake plants, like they'll live in a dark corner for a while, but then they'll yeah. like slowly start to yep. wither away. I think that's kind of what I was doing. I was just putting myself in a dark corner where I could like, I could still see that there were people there and people could see me, but I wasn't letting anybody in. I wasn't 
pushing myself to get near the window to be near you know what I mean is this making sense I know what you mean yeah thank you for sharing I think that's going to resonate with a lot of people and I feel like it's almost more painful to be in the corner where you can see the glimmers of light you might be able to get a little bit of what you need but 10 percent of what you need instead of just being fully cut off in the room the dark room with the closed door like fully cut off where you don't even remember what it's like to see the sunshine anymore. Like, I feel like it's so much more excruciating to be in the corner where you can see it, but you can't participate in it. And you're just kind of shuttered off. And I think that's such a normal, I don't want to say normal or universal. I feel like that's such a universal experience of I feel, especially for women, I'm so annoying. Everybody hates me. Like those are thoughts. I have, I mean, that is like my biggest thing I talk about in therapy, you know, it's like, that is such a universal experience. And I love this concept. And also I'm like, okay, and in that, what does the light represent? Does the light represent community? Does the light represent positivity? Does the light represent perspective? But like, what is it that you're reaching for wanting more of, but not stepping into, you know? Mm -hmm. Totally. And just also in some scenarios, just not even being able to, like, even if you wanted to be more towards the light, like you're a plant, you can't move, you know, I mean, you can't move and you're frozen. Yeah. And that's something about living rural as well is you can be very isolated. And I moved away from my family, my friends. And of course, I've made a few friends here that have been really great, but it's just different. And it's not like it, it took time. I don't think that I really made good friends. Oh, I had one really good friend from the start and she's been incredible. But like, let's say a group like I had at home. And so, yeah, especially when you go through something like becoming a mom in this like isolated space, you feel like you really need people, but nobody can really come because everybody has lives. Nobody can. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's harder when you're rural. Like, It's 20 minutes to get to the grocery store, right? So, I mean, I deeply resonate with that. I feel very lonely in the woods as well. Like I I wouldn't trade this experience for the world and I'm very ready to go back to civilization because the loneliness has started. I needed to come here to heal from a lot of stuff and I needed the isolation. And now I'm like, okay, the isolation is driving me crazy. But I also feel like when you live rurally, like it's just hard. Like my friends and I, We'll make dinner plans, but then if there's bad weather because we live rurally and the roads are bad, like we can't go out if there's a storm because you can't trust the roads and the roads aren't going to get plowed until the morning and and there's no lights outside and there's, you know, there's just little things that you don't really realize when you move rurally that it's 30 minutes for me to get to the local coffee shop. So that's 30 minutes there. That's, you know, an hour, 90 minute coffee and then 30 minutes back. That's half your day. Yeah, there's like an accessibility that you lose. And I definitely want to have you back on to talk about country living, because I think a lot of people have either moved to the country in the pandemic or they desire to move to the country. And I've loved it. And I know you and I have talked so much offline about, you know, about it. But any final thoughts on people who might be stepping into a move, who might be making, you know, you... You definitely made a much more drastic move than I did, even though I moved more frequently than you did. Like you moved completely different garden zones, completely different part of the country, hugely different type of home. So for people making your type of really extreme move, any departing final thoughts and and advice for them? I would say give yourself plenty of time to land and adjust in every way. So yourself and your plants, because... Yeah, it's a, it's a huge adjustment for your plants. And I feel like I was so much quicker to give my plants grace than I was for myself. Because, yeah, the plants, I was like, oh, well, they used to live in this window and now they're living in this window and they are getting different humidity. And I came up with all of these reasons to justify why they weren't doing very well. And I did not give myself that same grace at all, at all. And I think it's normal to struggle mentally, emotionally moving, especially if you're moving away from people that you've created a community with. That's really hard. And I would say just give yourself just as much, if not more grace than your plants. I'm a very big like people over plants person. So you're way more valuable than your plants. And I think that's 
a silly thing to say out loud, but it's something that I need to hear all the time. Yes, people need to hear it. <laughs> yep, agreed, 100%. Yeah, 100%. So, and, you know, if it means that your plants don't come with you and you just get new plants or, you know, there's just so many things. Like, there's no... No judgment here. Yeah, there's no judgment. You don't have to do yeah. anything. You could stop having plants if you want. That's fine. And if you need to get rid of plants, I know I write, the, write about this in my book, but like, if you need to get rid of plants, give them to your local nursing homes, give them to your local plant friends, make a post in your local Facebook group and make someone's day. If Becca with, you know, or either of us, we both have some pretty cool plants in our collections. If I was putting my Thai constellation, if I was just giving it away, I would make someone's day with that, right? Take them to nursing homes. You can get some to hospitals will take them. A lot of hospitals won't, but you don't just have to throw them out if that would make you feel bad. Figure out how you could give your plants another life, you know? One other thing I wanted to say before we leave, because I find that this has been a low key, like one of the most valuable things I've learned since moving is find your local plant shop as soon as possible and make friends with the owner or the shop people. Because if you're moving somewhere that's a new garden zone, if you're moving somewhere and you're lonely and you don't have plant friends, like when I first moved to the country and I found my local houseplant shop and I just like, I never even hung out with the people that worked there, but it felt so nice to go to a plant shop, make eye contact with a person say a plant Latin name and have them not look at me like I was a crazy person, have some sort of weird deep dive 15 minute conversation about what Calathea I should buy or not buy in that moment, and then leave. And I don't know, like it was an opportunity to be seen in a way that I didn't feel seen in in that moment of life. And so I feel like that that's a real gift you can give yourself. And also what I have found is the little old ladies in the garden centers have the best advice on gardening. If you have questions about gardening, if you are a new gardener, you need to go find the little old ladies or the little old people in the garden center who are working there. Yesterday, I was in the garden center. This woman had her own pruners. As I was loading my plants up, loading my shopping cart up with plants, she was like pruning the plants to make sure that they were deadheaded for me. She talked to me about this plant that I had never had before. Like she would have talked to me for two hours and she gave me so much amazing advice. And I'm like, Will you be my new grandma? I love you. (laughs) (laughs) You know, that's been extremely helpful for me. That's another thing about living rural is people are just like that. Yes. They want to talk to you because they're lonely too. <laughs> We're a, you don't take a connection as for granted as much for sure when you're rural. Yeah. The people are just so generous. Yeah. It's amazing. Becca, I love talking with you. I love that this was a conversation about moving with plants and we just went so deep on loneliness and you know all this kind of stuff you're such a treasured plant friend of mine I know you have like you mentioned so well you have so much incredible video content in the world and your own podcast I know you have moving content I also want to go back and check out that houseplant aesthetic series I think I missed that where can everyone find you on your multiple channels and platforms and all the stuff you do you do so many things (laughs) I know I've got all my hands in every pot, it feels like. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so I'm on YouTube as Becca De La Plants and Instagram De La Plants, also on TikTok, but TikTok is more like mom random stuff. Mm-hmm. And then my podcast is Potted Together with my two friends, Adam and Nicole. Yeah, Potted Together. We love Potted Together. Go give them a listen. And I personally love your TikTok. I love your random mom thoughts. Oh, thank you. Some of my favorite content of yours. So yeah, we'll make sure everything's linked, but go check out Becca's amazing YouTube channels. I learn so much and I do love that you have a lot of plants, but you also have lifestyle stuff because the thing I'm realizing too with these plant fluencers and plant people and myself included as I kind of explore what I want to share is yes, plants are amazing, but there are so many other interesting things about us. And I like personally learning about all facets of a creator's life and experience, even if plants end up being their niche. So I love that about your content, my friend. And I love you. And let's have you back on soon for a deep dive into country living. Yeah, let's do it. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you to all your sweet listeners for listening. Awesome. Thank you so much, Becca. I love her. She really is the real deal of a friend. She's a beautiful story of meeting someone online and really turning them into a real life friend who like you talk to about more than just plants. She's so special. I hope you go check out her 
YouTube channel. She recently interviewed me on her YouTube channel and we did this whole video on plant friendships. It's so amazing. But you can check her out at Becca De La Plants on YouTube or De La Plants on Instagram and her social channels. Also check out her book, House Plants for Beginners. She's a wonderful person to follow and I hope she is my plant friend forever and ever. Thank you so much for tuning in today, plant friends. I hope if you are moving that you have an easy move, that you find your dream home, that your move is effortless, that these tips help you, and that in your new home, you use your house plants and your gardens to keep growing joy. Plant friend, thank you for tuning in today. It means so much to me that I get to be part of your planty journey. If you like what you heard, make sure you're subscribed to the show so you never miss an episode. We have so many incredible interviews and solo episodes on incredible houseplant and gardening topics that you will not want to miss this year. And while you're over there in the podcast player subscribing, why don't you click over to the review section of Growing Joy with Plants and leave us a review. Reviews are tremendously helpful for the growth of the podcast, so thanks in advance. If you're looking for more opportunities to grow as a plant parent with Growing Joy content, we've got so many options for you. First, I highly recommend you taking the Plant Parent Personality Test. It's free, it's super fun, it takes three minutes to complete. At the end of the test, you're gonna get your Plant Parent Personality Profile and a curated list of plants, projects, and podcast episodes that are right up your alley, tailored just for you and your lifestyle, inspired by your results. The links are in the show notes. If you're looking to uplevel your Plant Parent game, I have so many free downloads on my website that I think could help you, like the Understanding Natural Light download or nine different ways to green up your office space. If you'd like to support the show monetarily and help me bring the show to as many people as possible for free, you can head to our Patreon link in the show notes to learn more about our offerings. And finally, I invite you to come hang out with me and continue the planty conversation on social media, on Instagram and TikTok. I'm growing joy with Maria. My DMs are always open if you have requests for topics or ideas for the show. Thank you again for listening. It is truly my honor and delight to help you keep blooming and keep growing joy.